Now let's talk about the war in Ukraine. A few weeks back, Kiev launched a counter-offensive, did not achieve very much. It has descended into a stalemate, a frozen conflict. Ukraine's Western allies see this. A few days back, they tried a peace dialogue, the one in Saudi Arabia. Again, did not achieve much. So now the Western camp seems to have changed tack. They're sending out feelers again. They want to know the cost of a settlement. What will be the price tag? If the war were to end today, what will it take? That's what the West wants to know. Perhaps a sacrifice from Ukraine. That's what they're hinting at. Ukraine should be prepared to give up land. It's a big ask, considering we know Ukraine's stated position. They want all the territory captured by Russia to be returned to them. That's what Ukraine wants. They also want a complete integration with the Western Bloc, a.k.a. full NATO membership. That is Ukraine's wish list. But is the NATO prepared for this? Unlikely, if you look at their latest statement. It comes from a man called Stian Jenison, the chief of staff of NATO Secretary General Stoltenberg. He has floated a suggestion. He says Ukraine should give up some land to be able to join the NATO. A Norwegian newspaper reported these comments. We have a copy. The statement is unambiguous. Listen to what it says. I think a possible solution for Ukraine could be to give up the territory in exchange for NATO membership. I'm not saying it has to be exactly like that, but it can be a probable solution. Classic kite flying. He's also made some revelations. He said the discussions have begun, that key stakeholders in NATO are involved in these discussions. They're discussing Ukraine's prospects vis-a-vis -vis NATO. Can it join the alliance? with what kind of status and so on. These are the questions they're deliberating upon. So will they encourage Ukraine to cede territory? Well, Jenison did not say that. He said it was up to Kiev to decide when the talk should begin, under what conditions, and what the terms of negotiation should be. But will ceding territory be a part of this conversation? Other NATO members are asking this question, at least behind closed doors. They're raising this question. What about Ukraine? What is their reaction? Kiev is obviously unhappy. It has slammed the idea. An advisor to Zelensky has called it, quote-unquote, ridiculous. Listen to the full statement. I'm quoting again. That means deliberately choosing the defeat of democracy, encouraging a global criminal, preserving the Russian regime, destroying international law, and passing the war on to other generations. That is Ukraine's response. They refuse to give up land, at least for now. And they remain stuck in the conflict. With all the Western weapons and support Ukraine has got over the last one year, it has not been able to make the gains it hoped to. The likes of America are now saying this openly. Last month, the Pentagon said that Ukraine's counteroffensive is moving slowly. Things are going a little slower than uh, some had hoped. There are very high expenditures of artillery rate. Despite this assessment, they gave more support to Kiev. In fact, the U.S. made a controversial move. It gave cluster bombs to Ukraine. Even that did not help. The West wanted to see gains on the battlefield. So far, they've given more than $80 billion in military assistance to Kiev. But look at the map of Ukraine. It hasn't changed very much. Russia still controls about 11% of Ukrainian territory. After the much-hyped counteroffensive, Ukraine has managed to regain only 3% of the lost land. And the big prizes still remain with Russia, Crimea, Zaporizhia, Kherson, and most of the Donbass region, all under Russian control. The counteroffensive was supposed to change this map. It was supposed to force the Kremlin to the negotiating table. That has not happened. Now, the West cannot keep signing blank checks. They will have to reassess their options. Zelensky may want to keep the war going. He may even want to launch another counteroffensive next spring. But will his allies support him? The U.S. is already under pressure. Recently, a poll was conducted. Americans were asked about their government aid to Ukraine. The results are telling. 55% Americans opposed the idea of more aid. They did not want more American money to be spent on this war in Ukraine. That's a worry for Kiev and an opportunity for Moscow. They're holding a defense exhibition as we speak. It's happening in Kubinka. Among the exhibits is this. Western weapons apparently seized by Russian forces in the battlefield. They look heavily damaged. The Russian defense minister who was at this event had this to say about these weapons. As for the Western-made weapons supplied to Ukraine, 
I want to emphasize once again that there is nothing unique and invulnerable about them to Russian weapons on the battlefield today. In many cases, even Soviet-made equipment surpasses Western models in its combat qualities. So Russia is building a new narrative and Ukraine is struggling on the battlefield. Is Zelensky prepared to sacrifice territory to join the NATO? A lot will depend on how his forces perform in the days ahead. And since we're talking about democracies in distress, let's look at what's happening in Niger. It's been a busy week for them. Militants have attacked Niger's armed forces. At least 17 soldiers have been killed. Meanwhile, the country has cut all diplomatic ties and is trying to forge new ones. It has recalled its ambassador from Ivory Coast. The new prime minister appointed by the junta has gone on a visit to Chad. A militia supporting the coup is beginning to take shape and the junta chief in neighboring Mali is dropping cryptic hints about Russian support. I said a lot of developments. Also tomorrow, the generals of the West African bloc ECOWAS will meet in Ghana. They're expected to decide on the way forward. Will they attack Niger to force the military to reinstate the depot's president? A lot of geopolitical moves to track here. At the same time, the situation inside Niger is devolving into chaos. At this rate, powers outside Africa may soon get involved. Here's a report. Niger's military ousted the democratically elected president, Mohamed Bazoum, on July 26th. They gave a host of justifications. One of the main ones was the failure in dealing with militant extremists. West Africa has been facing extremists for years now. The US and European nations partnered with governments in the region to combat the militants. But the militaries in Mali, Burkina Faso and now Niger became impatient. They said the democratic governments weren't doing enough and proceeded to conduct coups. Well, militancy hasn't gone away in West Africa. And it reared its ugly head again in Niger yesterday. It claimed the lives of 17 soldiers from Niger. This was near the border between Niger and Burkina Faso, barely 60 kilometers away from Niger's capital, Niamey. The junta claims it took down a hundred of the attackers and that the threat was dealt with. But instability in the region is rising, caused by all the recent coups in West Africa and it's creating the space for militants to regroup and expand. So the coups may be adding fuel to the fire. However, extremists aren't the only threat to Niger's junta. They also have to worry about a military intervention by ECOWAS. It's a regional bloc. ECOWAS is short for Economic Community of West African States. And the group threatened to invade if President Bazoum wasn't reinstated. The deadline was about 10 days ago. But ECOWAS hasn't marched on Niger yet. They've set up a standby force. And the military chiefs of ECOWAS nations are meeting tomorrow. But there's no definite sign of an impending intervention. There are three factors behind this. One is local sentiment. Nigeria currently chairs ECOWAS. And Nigerians, especially from the country's north, share close ties to the people of Niger. Leaders from northern Nigeria have been trying to prevent a conflict. They've been trying to deepen diplomatic channels between Niger's junta and Nigeria. The second factor pausing the military intervention is the West. The US and Europe are still holding out hope for a diplomatic solution. When the deadline to reinstate Bazoum expired, Germany and Italy appealed for calm. Yesterday, the US weighed in. We remain very focused on diplomacy for achieving uh, the, uh, the results that we want, which is the return to the constitutional order. Um, and I believe that there uh, continues to be space for diplomacy in achieving that result. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says there's still space for diplomacy. But the U.S. also believes that the space is shrinking. And if Niger's junta goes through with its threat to prosecute President Bazoum for high treason, that diplomatic space may close completely. Niger's junta knows this, so it's been trying to gather allies. Which is the third thing preventing the military escalation. Niger's junta already has the support of Mali and Burkina Faso. Both countries saw their own coups recently. And the military dictatorships all seem to be banding together. 
Niger's military leaders also seem to have the tacit support of the junta in Guinea. And now they're reaching out to Chad. Chad also saw a coup recently in 2021. And yesterday, Niger's new junta-appointed prime minister went to Chad on his first state visit. So, a block of coup-hit nations seems to be forming. And they seem to have one thing in common, support from Russia. Mali's junta chief, Colonel Asimi Goita, put up this post yesterday. He said he spoke to Russian President Vladimir Putin over the phone. Putin wants a peaceful resolution to the Niger crisis, which means he's against the military intervention by ECOWAS. Remember, Mali and Burkina Faso got closer to Russia after their own coups. Mali even has Russia's Wagner mercenary group operating on its soil. And with his phone call, Putin showed that he has an eye on Niger as well. So these three factors, local sentiment, the Western push for diplomacy, and the support of pro-Russia juntas in West Africa, these factors have created a tense status quo in the region. So the ECOWAS generals have to think carefully. Any change to this tenuous situation may cause West Africa to erupt in war. And it's likely that the fires won't stay in the Sahel alone. And speaking of weapons, two Western nations are vying for India's attention, Germany and Spain. They're eager to sell submarines to India. New Delhi plans to buy six submarines. It'll be a contract worth $4.8 billion. And who are these contenders? The first bid came from Germany, from a company called Tusun Krupp AG. And their Indian partner is Mazagaon Dock Shipbuilders. They're based in Mumbai. The second bid is from Spain. Their company is called Nevantia. They have a partnership with Larsen and Tubro. So which way is New Delhi leaning? Well, it's too early to say India is weighing its options. It has spelled out its requirements. On top of India's wish list is technology transfer. India wants the maximum possible transfer. So it comes down to the bidders, really. Whoever puts the best deal on the table and offers the biggest tech transfer will walk away with the deal. And what kind of submarines are these? These are conventional subs. Usually, these are run on diesel. They have electric motors. They're different from nuclear submarines, nuclear-powered submarines. They cannot stay submerged for long. They need to resurface quickly to refuel. Nuclear-powered submarines can stay underwater for longer periods because they can refuel with nuclear power. It's not an option with conventional subs. But they do have other, other benefits, their own benefits. Conventional submarines are small. They can carry ballistic missiles, even nuclear warheads. And they're cheaper to maintain. All major navies in the world have conventional submarines. In fact, most of their fleet is made up of such subs, so it makes sense for India to invest in them too. The Indian Navy has a roadmap for this. India needs a fleet of 24 submarines. 18 will be conventional, 6 will be nuclear ones. And what do we have right now? As of December last year, India had a total of 16 submarines, all but one conventional. So 15 conventional and one nuclear submarine. It's called Arihant. Now, most of this fleet is aging. They will go out of service in a few years. Many of them are more than 30 years old. So they're likely to be decommissioned soon. The Navy is planning to upgrade and, and push for upgrades across the board, in fact. For the conventional subs, India wants them equipped with a different technology. It's called air-independent propulsion. What does it do? It improves endurance of the submarine. It also helps them stay underwater for longer. The machines that don't have the system must surface daily. This technology enables them to spend up to one week underwater at a stretch. Earlier this year, India signed a deal. It was with France. This was to upgrade existing submarines. They're all getting the air independent propulsion system. The system will be built in India and France will help in its integration. As for the nuclear submarine, Aryant, it is based on a Soviet design and it has some issues too. A report came out in 2019. It said the maiden deterrent patrol of this submarine lasted just 20 days. Experts say there are endurance issues too. Nuclear submarines are designed to stay underwater for much longer than this, sometimes months, even years if needed. They run on a nuclear reactor, so they get uninterrupted power supply. The only limitation, perhaps, is the supplies, the food and water for the crew. That needs to be replenished. The Indian sub seems to have been found wanting on these counts, so India is talking to France for an upgrade. 
He told you about this last month when Prime Minister Modi visited Paris. There was talk of a possible deal, but no announcement has been made yet. Reports say the agreement is yet to be sealed. The negotiations are still on. The European powers need the Indian defence market. But India too needs these deals to be able to maintain an optimal level of deterrence. The present fleet is not good enough. Like I said, India has 16 subs. Do you know how many China has? 66. And they're building more. What about Pakistan? Their Navy has eight submarines. All of them are conventional ones. Rawalpindi too is pushing for modernization. It is said to be getting eight new subs from China. We don't know who's going to pay for them. But we can see that the high seas could be the next battleground. The Indian Navy will need more firepower and submarines are a good place to start. Our next story is about 50 million people, 5 0, 50 million people. That's how many people live in modern slavery the world over, 50 million. Slavery by no means is a matter of the past. It continues to exist today. In fact, it's been on the rise. The number has risen by 10 million since 2018. But do you know what hasn't changed? The role of fashion in it. $148 billion worth of apparel is at the risk of being produced by forced labor. So is textile worth $13 billion. Your favorite fashion brands know about this, yet they continue to exploit workers. The latest brand under fire for this is Ralph Lauren, the luxury fashion giant. It has been accused of using China's Uyghur forced labor. Our next report tells you more. Now that's what you call high fashion. All of these celebrities are wearing one iconic brand, Ralph Lauren, a name that defined the so-called classic American style and now stands at the center of luxury fashion. Basically, all things glitz and glamour. But who knew all of this could be a crime against humanity? That's the allegation against the fashion giant. Ralph Lauren is under investigation. Canada's corporate watchdog is probing its unit in the country over allegations of forced labour. 28 civil society organisations jointly filed a complaint last year saying the brand uses forced labour from China's Uyghur community. Now, you may remember, the Uyghurs are a minority in China. Reports say over a million of them have been detained in camps there, re-education camps, the Chinese call them, where the Muslim community is exploited and abused and forced into modern slavery. Lawmakers in the West have repeatedly criticised China over it, even called for a crackdown. They call the treatment of Uyghurs in China a crime against humanity. They say it's a genocide, and they're probably not wrong. Reports say Uyghurs are tortured, forced to separate from families, and the women are forcefully sterilized. But Beijing continues to deny these accusations. No surprises there. Even so, Ralph Lauren isn't the first fashion brand accused of exploiting Uyghurs. So is Gap, Nike, Adidas, Muji, Tommy Hilfiger and Calvin Klein. A really long list. In fact, rights groups say virtually the entire fashion industry is complicit. They all have a role to play in the exploitation of Uyghurs who are only a small part of modern slavery today. About 50 million people are living in modern slavery today. 50 million. That's an increase of 10 million since 2018. And this number isn't limited to a few countries. It's spread across the world. But it mostly hurts those in India, Pakistan, China, Bangladesh, Thailand, Uzbekistan and Egypt. Fashion is one of the biggest culprits and the largest luxury brands like Louis Vuitton, Dior, Prada, are allegedly the worst offenders. Every year, the world produces apparel worth $148 billion that comes from forced labour. So do textiles worth about $13 billion, which are sold by our favourite fashion brands, by household names, by luxury moguls, who make big bucks off of them. But people forced into labour pay the price. They work under exploitative conditions, earn poor wages and often go unpaid. They suffer health and safety threats, debt bondage and risky living conditions. If it's so bad, why does it happen? For starters, forced labour is cheap. Secondly, no one is policing supply chains. There aren't enough guardrails in place. 97% of fashion brands have codes of conduct, but such policies are neither effective nor do they provide remedies. The result is ignorance and exploitation. So what can we do about it? 
Uh, we know that we have to protect people against the vulnerabilities which are at the heart of uh, forced labour. We have to uh, improve recruitment practices so that they are fair and they are ethical. We have to reinforce labour inspection and enforcement. All of these things, we know what works. We're just not doing it enough. There's your answer. It's easier said than done. But every worker has the right to a decent standard of living. It's barbaric to promote modern slave labour and even worse to be ignorant about it. This is 2023. For the sake of humanity, it's time slavery goes out of fashion. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. We are starting with India. Nature's fury is wreaking havoc in the state of Himachal Pradesh. Heavy rains and landslides led houses to collapse. In Spain, a massive wildfire is burning across the Canary Island. The situation on the ground has gone from bad to worse. In Italy, sudden flooding caused an alpine stream to burst its banks. Six people have been rescued. And finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day, in 1977, the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley, died. He was just 42 years old when he died because of a heart attack. But his melodies and his flamboyant personality lived on. We're leaving you with that. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.